Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm sitting with Liz and Marcus Bokish of Bokish Vineyards in Lodi, California. Marcus and Liz, welcome and tell us about Bokish. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So Bokish started in 20, in 2000, and our focus has been Spanish varietal wines. So it's a little bit unique, <laughs> and there's a reason for that. So my family on my mother's side, we are from Catalonia, so northeastern part of Spain. And uh, ever since we emigrated to the country, my parents made sure that we would go back on a regular basis so that we would have a really strong connection with my grandmother, uncles, aunts, cousins. And so that's what we did. Yeah, yeah and so I love that. Uh, it, was, it was really a wonderful thing, complaining as a kid that I didn't get to go to Boy Scouts and I got to live on, in the Mediterranean. <laughs> oh, how ungrateful. So, <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, it was a, a wonderful thing getting very close to the family. And then college came and the money went to college and five years went by, never went back. I met Liz. Mm-hmm. And we decided that we were going to return to Spain and work in the Spanish wine industry after college. And so, sure enough, we did that. We uh, went to Napa, lived there for three years, saved up our money. At that time, I was working at Joseph Phelps Vineyards. And then Liz was a teacher at Napa High School. And then we uh, packed our bags, drove yeah. our... We, we, we moved in, to Spain in a very unusual way. Uh, Marcus had a 67 VW bus, a split window. And so uh, we knew we were gonna wanna travel around Europe. And so we were thinking, oh, we might have to purchase a car. And then we realized, gee, you know, why don't we bring the bus? <laughs> then we'll have a camper. We can go anywhere we want on a shoestring budget that we had. And so we fixed it up, drove it across um, the United States, uh, shipped it um, over to um, Southampton and England, picked it up and then drove it, well, took the ferry over. And that was our vehicle for the full year. Wow. Year and a half, actually. Year and a half, yeah. And it was an amazing uh, year that we had discovering the wine regions of Europe and then also working um, in Spain, um, just outside of Barcelona, Ooh, in um, San Sarani de Noia, where they make the Spanish cavas. Ooh, yeah, it was, it was the year of the uh, Olympics in Barcelona, too. So it was very exciting, a lot of stuff going on there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we worked for a year and again, saved up our money and then spent six months just traveling all over Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, just going from wine region to wine region to understand the industry we were in. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun. And we really fell in love with the uh, French vigneron concept uh-huh. where you go and, you know, you have somebody who's uh-huh. growing their own grapes has a very small winery, making wine from their own grapes that they farm. And that idea just resonated with us. And that's kind of where planted the seed for us when we came back. Right, so that's what you are here in Lodi. You're vineyards. you have your own vineyard. So tell me um, how many um, acres do you have of your own vines and do you also source fruit from anyone else or are you exclusively a state? So we have a hundred acres planted that we own. And then we um, have that mostly in two vineyards, the Las Cerezas Vineyard, which is our home vineyard where we're at right now. It's also the mother block. This is where we brought all the cuttings in from Spain to grow them here in California. And then we have our larger vineyard, the Terra Alta Vineyard, which is the um, area where we were able to expand some of those blocks on the Spanish varieties. Mm -hmm. And we're also investors. Um, in quite a few different vineyards where Marcus was actively involved in selecting the vines and farming those vineyards as well. So the majority of what we do um, is estate grown fruit. And your total case production? 5,000 cases. And exclusively Spanish varieties? No. Ah. So tell us just really quickly, what are the different grapes you are working with and making? Okay, in terms of the white varieties, Spanish varieties, we deal with Albarino, Carnacha Blanca, Verdejo. We have had Verdello in the past, which is distinctly mm-hmm. different from Verdejo. <laughs> um, and uh, we also have Pique Poul Blanc. Uh, we also play around with some uh, Rhone mm-hmm. varietals in what are, is called our Trincadis winemaker selection, <clears throat> which includes Roussan, Marsan, 
and Viognier. Oh, so okay. quite yeah. a lofty yeah. white portfolio. Yeah, yeah, but really focused on that Mediterranean influence. You know, that is all we've always loved uh, Rhone style wines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And then red wines? On the red wines, we have the Garnacha or Garnacha Tinta. We have the Monastrel or Morvedra. We have obviously the Tempranillo. We make a Carignan, and that's the only fruit that we actually source from a grower on the west side of Lodi, Old Vine 1920s Carignan. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, we also have Malbec, and uh, we make a Petit Verdot. We make a Syrah from vines that Marcus and I planted ourselves by hand uh, when we came back from that trip from Spain that I was telling you about. Um, so. Yeah, we, you know, we do our main, we're known for our Spanish varieties, but... Um, you got a few French got, in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. But the, my favorite is the Graciano. Oh, oh yes. yeah. And uh, we were the very first to bring it to the, to the new world. Yeah. We were the very uh, first to make a bottling of Graciano. Mm. And it's kind of funny because when we brought it over, the whole idea was to use it as a blending component for Tempranillo like they do in the Rioja La Vesa. But we loved it so much on its own that we decided to make its own bottling. Ah. So. Well, tell me something. Um, you've obviously, wine has been something that has intrigued you. And growing up with a Spanish background, you probably were exposed to it more. What is your first memory relevant to wine? Mm, good question. Well, I have a very distinct memory <laughs> relevant to wine. I have my story too. Okay. <laughs> So my, uh, when we went to Spain, my, fa- my grandfather had built a big country house that was right on the Mediterranean. And unfortunately he had passed away. But my grandmother always hosted us in that house along with, because there were so many rooms, uncles and aunts and cousins, and we spent the entire summer there. And at uh, lunchtime at three in the afternoon, we would all, the entire family, like 20 of us sit around the, di- the lunch table and we would be given wine but the kids were always given wine that was diluted with water. (laughs) And so the older you got, the dilution changed. So when I was, my first memory was basically very, very pink water, which had just a couple drops of red wine from the Terra Alta region of Spain. And by the time I was 13 or 14, then it was like a rosé. And by the time I was 16, it was full on wine. (laughs) Well, and that's what I love about Spain because wine is food and you, always have wine with your meal and you never see anybody having iced tea with lunch. I no, mean, that would be ridiculous, you know, it goes together. But my first memory is um, my dad, um, he was a high school art teacher and he had a buddy in Sonoma. I grew up in uh, Placer County up in Lincoln and uh, his his um, teaching buddy was a science teacher and he, he lived, of course, in the heart of Sonoma. And he's like, hey, um, Alvar, why don't you come over and make wine with me? So when we were kids, we would go over and we'd pick, we'd glean, which is like picking the second uh, crop after the first Mm -hmm. harvest. And we would uh, make wine and bring it home. And I remember the bathtub having some carboys in it (laughs) and that smell of fermentation, which I thought was horrible at the time, you know, when I was young. Well, so you have childhood memories, which is amazing. And then you've traveled around the world and that's pretty extraordinary. So what was that one wine? I'm sure there were many, but what was that one aha moment wine? It could have been earlier in your career or later, but what was that wine? Do you remember? Yes, (laughs) I do. Um, When I got into the business, uh, the reason I got into the wine business was actually kind of happenstance. Liz and I had met We decided that uh, I had already gotten a job to go to the Peace Corps in Guatemala. Liz had already gotten a job to teach English in Madrid. And we did put our our programs on hold (laughs) and said, let's try to find local jobs and see if this relationship is going to work out. And Napa Valley was right next door. So I went to see if I could get a viticulture position in Napa Valley. And I just happened to be so fortunate as to get it at Joseph Phelps Vineyards, which just was and is an amazing producer of Mm -hmm. Cabernets, Chardonnays, et cetera. And uh, I remember very clearly the first bottle of Isley Vineyard Cabernet that I had. It was phenomenal. And um, it forever ruined me to for Cabernet. (laughs) (laughs) That's a bar high for sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome bottle of wine. It was amazing. Do you remember the vintage? 
Uh, that was 1989, so it would have been in 83. Ooh. Yeah. Good yeah. memory. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Liz? Oh my gosh. I don't have a specific <clears throat> wine, but I just remember, you know, growing up drinking my dad's home wine, and he had this one that was called Killer Zin because he loved Zinfandel. And I think I brought a bottle of it to yeah. one of our first dates. Um, <laughs> that I Killer it. Zin. Uh, we had <laughs> a picnic in the VW bus. Yeah. So yeah. that's one of my favorite bottles. Oh, I love it. So you guys have traveled the world abroad um, and seen all the different wine regions. Um, what would you say is one of your favorite wine regions in the world that you've visited? Hmm. Well, I mean, I have a really special um, place in my heart for the Terra Alta wine region, which is the region closest to Marcus's hometown. Um, that's kind of their backyard area. And... Um, there's something about that region that I really, it resonates with me because it's similar to Lodi in the sense that it's sort of been overlooked. Um, they make beautiful, wonderful wines, um, but hasn't gotten the, the fame and acclaim. And so there's a lot of camaraderie there and it's just um, the best uh, Garnacha Blancas and mm -hmm. Garnachas come from that region. So that's one of my favorites. You know, I, I might have kind of stole yours from you. No, no, you know, I was going to say that uh, that one's so close to my heart that I have a hard time <laughs> mentioning it because it's just like, uh -huh. you know, it's where our family grew up or nearby. Uh, it's very close to the Priorat for those people who don't know where the Terra Alta is. But, you know, aside from that, I don't know that I have necessarily a favorite one because I think of, let's say, driving through Tuscany and seeing those beautiful hills in the San Giovese, so many different clones in every valley. But we also drove the bus through the Dodo Valley, all the way from like mm -hmm. the Spanish, uh, Spanish Portuguese border, all the way to Porto, and it was just like amazing. So every region is yeah. just that's one thing about wine regions; is they tend to be extremely beautiful and mm -hmm. wonderful and memory creating. Well, I mean, yes. So you've traveled so many wonderful places, and I'm guessing you've amassed wine throughout your travels. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if I were to walk into your wine cellar. Um, I don't know if it's 100 bottles or 500 bottles or 20 <laughs> bottles, but what kind of wines would we find in there? Gee, you might even find some of our old home wine making wine. <laughs> we uh, can't seem to get rid of all that. I'm sure it's horrible because <laughs> we started out at home, as home winemakers uh, as well. Um, but uh, there's definitely a variety of things local and um, overseas. Um, most, a lot of um, old library wines of Bokish, actually, oh, right. from when we first got started down there. Yeah, and to kind of keep our palate sharp and understand what's happening in Spain, uh, we have quite a lot of Spanish wine that we constantly go through because mm -hmm. we need to, <laughs> we need, well, our whole goal is to try to make wines that would be mistaken as Spanish wines. Mm -hmm. We want to be true to the varietal climatically, and et cetera, um, and organoleptically. And so, and I think we've achieved that, but we need to always be seeing what's cutting edge over yeah. time. So is there a bottle of wine you opened recently that drank really well? One of those Spanish uh, wines or something else? Hmm. Well, we do know from experience that um, the Tempranillos really do age amazingly. And there's a reason why they have that designation of of Crianza Reserva mm -hmm. and Gran Reserva in, in our own wines as well um, that age so well. But surprisingly, um, we did a tasting of our Albarinos that it was amazing to see how well mm. they held up. Cause you don't think of- We did of a vertical, that. yeah. Yeah, we did a vertical and it was, we weren't expecting that. And uh, when we started picking our, our, our grapes at a lower bricks level, we realized that they can really hold up uh -huh. that has that natural acidity. And um, so that was a definite surprise for me. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, I think um, we re remember that bottle of wine. I can't remember the producer right now, but it was a Listan from the Canary Islands. Beautiful, mm -hmm. white, mm -hmm. crisp wine. And it was absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. <gasps> There's, um, there's another wine, by the way, that came later in my career that I can never oh, yeah. forget. What and we it? had this up in Seattle, a Roda, R-O-D-A. Beautiful Tempranillo wine. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure there are a few aha moments of wine. Yeah. You get to drink a lot of good wine. So do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Oh boy, that is a hard question. I do not. 
I do not. Nah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that's just ad- adapting to your the variety to the region mm-hmm. is what's important. You know? yeah. yeah, and then although our, a lot of our wines are 100% with no blending, I, we truly are believers in blends. We really believe that even 1% of something can improve. And we've mm-hmm. seen that mm-hmm. often with the use of Graciano and de Tempranillo. 1% to 2% can markedly improve or fill out or complete a Tempranillo. Yeah, yeah but we do so. get asked a lot, like, what's your favorite wine of our of own course. wines, you know? And it's like... <laughs> it's like picking your favorite child. It is, it is. <laughs> and so Marcus, for sure, his, his favorite is the Graciano just because of how unknown it is. And it, once you become a Graciano lover, you're a Graciano lover for life. <laughs> <laughs> what's your opinion on wine critics and scores? Hmm. Well, I think uh, it's sort of a luck of the draw. Sometimes, I mean, I think it's great when you when you great when you score well and you win big, and when you don't, and you know that that wine is just as good or better than previous years, you realize it's just luck of the draw. Sometimes, because there are so many wines in these competitions and. And you've got to catch that that wine judge or that person at the right moment and uh, lined up with the right wines for all the stars to align. Mm-hmm. So, um, but there is one uh, competition that is really dear to our hearts that um, we entered um, that's called the uh, Grenache du Monde um, International Competition. And it's held in, um, in Europe. Um, it was held in Spain in the Terra Alta region, the first time we entered the competition. And it, we're the only American winery that has um, been part of that competition for the last three years, and this will be our fourth year. And how have you done? We have gotten a gold medal every year. First two years on our Grenache Blanca, and the last year on our Red Grenache. And it's, it was really important to us because we're up against only, you know, Italian, Spanish, French, um, and a few other uh, Australian. Australian wines. But to us, that really shows that we're doing, we're meeting our goal of, of really trying to achieve that true varietal character of our wines. Right. I, I think one thing that I really liked about that competition, too, is to get to know the judges. So the judges were all deeply, deeply steeped in wine knowledge. They were international, all the way from South Korea to France, mm-hmm. and uh, and they took uh, every aspect of wine tasting seriously, uh, like the temperature in the room or whatnot. So I've never seen a wine tasting that was so professional and so so well judged. Mm-hmm. So so there's some value to some, and you've achieved your goal, which is really impressive. That yeah. in a blind tasting, people wouldn't know it's from California. I know right. exactly. So quick answer. Red, white, or rosé? White. Rosé. Still or sparkling? Still. Still. <laughs> yeah, you're almost we on are, the same path. We are. <laughs> <laughs> we are finally going to be uh, uh, making our very first sparkling Albarino. Ooh. So maybe sparkling will be um, on that list. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> so for somebody who hasn't had the privilege to taste Bokish wines yet, what do you think they're missing out on? Well, let's see. I think part of it is, and this is something that Lodi does so well, is it's a very, uh, it's a huge experience. It's not just about the wine. So yes, we want to make the best wines possible for Lodi, for Spain. We just want to do the right by the variety. But we also, and Liz can speak to this, are very focused on combining those wines with Spanish food. Mm -hmm. So tapas and paella and everything. And so when someone comes to within the you know purview of our club it's an entire experience of spain not just mm-hmm. one aspect not just the wine yeah so. and i would i would add that you know i mean going back to the days where you were working at joseph phelps and i was a teacher at napa high school and you'd come home with these half open bottles of isley cab or or insignia or whatnot you know that was our regular drinking wine and we realized one of our goals was to create a really high crafted beautiful wine but at a uh, approachable price point because because mm-hmm. like you said we yeah we could never have tasted those wines <laughs> no. and so so i think if you haven't had bocas you're really missing out on a really amazing product that is you know we're we're the vignerons it's organically farmed sustainably farmed handcrafted we use real barrels and it's a real product made by real people and appro- yeah affordable <laughs> yeah. and you can enjoy it every day 
So if space aliens were to land on your property right now, which of your wines would you want to welcome them with? <laughs> uh, well, Albarino tends to be our welcome wine yeah. uh, because it's so approachable. And one of the things we found out about Albarino is a lot of people who come to the tasting room and they say, oh, I only drink red wine. Of course, we get the, that happens a lot. We're like, okay, well, why don't you just taste this Albarino and see what you think? Um, and we find that it really is a crowd pleaser because of, of the amount of aromatics and the flavor profiles, the acidity levels. It's um, it's definitely the most of the crowd pleaser, I would say. Yeah. So, okay, so Albarino, you don't disagree? Oh, I, I think Albarino is fantastic. It's a real crowd <laughs> Is that what pleaser. you would welcome them with? I would say that mm. the other one might be the Garnacha Blanca. Mm. It's uh. also a big crowd <laughs> yeah. pleaser. It's delicious. <laughs> so y- you've been here for a while. You, you live on your property where the mother vineyard is. Um, mm-hmm. So you're in the vines on a daily basis. Mm. Um, how much variation do you see from vintage to vintage? Or do you find a little bit more... Uh, consistency. What do you what do you see happening? Yeah, we see a lot of uh, differentiation from vintages, and that's one of the beautiful things about buying handcrafted wines is you can actually taste the vintage as opposed to having something which is purposefully blended so that it every year it's the exact same thing. So while you can always open up an Albarino and say, "Oh yeah, that is an Albarino," in some years uh, you will get, for example, the Terra Alta Albarino. Maybe one out of every four years, you'll get a little grapefruit citrus rind characteristic, which you would find in Galicia. Doesn't happen every year. Other years, you'll get more of a tangerine sweet citrus. You'll also have varying amounts of stone fruit characters, like apricot or maybe peach on another year. And those are all vintage related. And they're all vintage related, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... When you're here in your vineyard and living here, do you look for any signs or predictors that are going to tell you what a vintage is going to be like? Mm. 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 Well, what we do is, particularly let's stay with this one variety here, Albarino. We know that Al- we don't like to add acid. We like to be as minimalist as possible with our wines. And so we have to pick early. We want to pick early. Unlike in Galicia, where it rains and it's much cooler, They'll pick at the same bricks level as we will, but they'll do that in September while we do it in early August. <laughs> so we're always looking for the bricks number so that it's nowhere, no more than 21 bricks. And the difficulty with that, and it took us years to figure this out, is that at 21 bricks, the flavors are not fully present when you're eating the berries, mm. but all the precursors are already there. So if you're a typical Californian winemaker and what you want to do is taste the berries and talk about when the the fruit's going to be ripe, you're going to get an overly ripe Albarino. So it is really trusting something as opposed to um, tasting it. It's knowing the science of it. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you um, tend to take walks through your vineyard and talk to your vines? And if so, what do you say to them? <laughs> Mr. Marcus Bukish, the farmer, what do you say? I walk through the vineyards often, uh-huh. and uh, I, in the winter, I'm a, I, I loved identifying mushrooms. So I'm always looking at the leaf litter. I'm looking at the the soil health, the earthworms. And are you talking to them? I do. Oh. I do. And Out I loud? Yes, and I talk to them in <laughs> Catalan. So I'll because I don't have a lot of people to speak Catalan with. <laughs> So I'll be going out in the vineyard and talking Catalan, which they understand like, perfectly what well. What would you say to the... Yeah, Catalan. what do you Give say? I'd say, ¿Cómo esteo? ¿Cómo esteo contens? Necesite agua. O puede ser que tiene una amiga de gana, pero la nutrición. So... <laughs> and do they answer? They do. They do. And on windier days, they tend to speak a little louder. You can hear the wind rustling <laughs> through the leaves. <laughs> so. That's So it sounds like wine was something that not only was part of your childhood and growing up in Sonoma for you, Liz, um, but something you picked pretty early in college that you wanted to pursue in some way. Um, But when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Mm, Well, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing about the wine business. Very few people think, when I grew up, I want to be a (laughs) winemaker. You know, you're thinking, you know. But I was definitely on the track for being a teacher. Um, that is actually in our, in our family, my dad being a high school art teacher. Oh, so from a young uncle. age. So from a young age for me, it was a teacher. What about for you? 
Well, for me, my dad was a researcher. He was an immunologist, and uh, I'd always go, we'd go visit him during his lunch break, and he'd have his white lab coat on and everything. And so I really thought that that's what I wanted to do. And I went to uh, UC Davis uh, as a biochemistry major, thinking that that's what I was just impassioned about. And but then I, you took a wine course. Oh, no, you know what happened, you know? <laughs> that's what I usually hear. I, act, <laughs> I actually had a different path because what happened was that I realized that I kind of atrophied in a lab situation. I'm an outdoors applied kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into uh, international agricultural development, which is what I had ended up graduating in. Interesting. And I was really interested in rice because if um, you look at Spain, it's the single largest European rice producing country because of paella. And uh, we were next to the California Delta at UC Davis, and our little village in Spain is right next to the Ebro Delta. And on my grandmother's side, we were all rice farmers. So I thought, maybe that's how I'm gonna get into agriculture. I'm gonna go and become like a, a researcher, or I'm gonna become a um, advisor in rice. And, and rice today. production can feed the world. And rice production yeah. can feed the world, yeah. And wine, I thought, I love wine. I've been exposed to wine since I was a little kid, but everyone knows you can't make a living in the wine industry. <laughs> Never would have considered it. So when we moved to Napa after Liz and I realized we just needed to put our lives on hold and explore our relationship, we moved to Napa. The idea was, what a great place to spend a year or two in an industry where I can understand the pathology of everything that wants to attack a grapevine. And then you get bit by the wine bug and, and two years turns into 20. Yeah. <laughs> that's what happened. How, that's how did we get here? So when you're not working in wine, although this is your life and you live in it, what do you do for in your free time? What do you like to do? Well, I, I love reading. My favorite thing to do is to sit outdoors by the pool or by a, a campfire and read my books. So I'm an avid reader um, and I also like to garden. So we always have a winter garden and summer garden. So those are, those are two of my favorite hobbies. I love tinkering on our 1967 split window bus that we still own. <laughs> Does it move? It moves beautifully. <laughs> and we take it at least once a month on an overnighter to the foothills to go camping. Aww. So mm. yeah, we're, that, that thing is gonna, I, I have an issue with that, with the bus though. I really need two because that way my kids won't fight for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also heard you're learning the guitar. And yes, I am learning music appreciation via the guitar. So it's so a few things to keep you busy. Yeah, yeah. you know, and I think that's I think it's great because you're never you're too old to try something new. You know. So when you're planning a romantic evening for the two of you, um, I mean, your kids are out of the house. They'll come, they're coming back, but they're currently out of the house uh, at college, and and. It's you too. When you plan a romantic evening, I mean, maybe it's getting in the VW and taking a road trip, but what sort of wine set, um, what make for a romantic evening for each of you? Let's see if you're on the same page. <laughs> well, um, we, I, I love to cook. I should say that's also one of my main um, hobbies and um, I'm just passionate about food. So for me, I, a romantic evening is opening a, a bottle of wine Preferably a light white, maybe a Garnacha Blanca or Peak Pool and uh, start to fiddle in the kitchen and then then go down to the cellar and open up something old and aged and decant it and just sit outside if possible and enjoy a nice lingering evening under the stars. Yeah, one thing that we do very well, I have to say, <laughs> mm -hmm. is that every night we always have dinner together. We I, mm -hmm. I'm your cooking assistant and <laughs> the bottle too. opener. You are excellent. So, uh, so we we have really wonderful. That's one of the great joys of our relationship is getting home at mm -hmm. nighttime and spending time together and eating together. And would you two start with like a light Garnacha Blanca and move into a, you know, vintage cellared wine? for the romantic evenings? Oh yeah. Or would absolutely. you start with something else? No, 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 we would typically start with either an Albarino or a Caracha Blanca, uh, Peak Pool Blanc occasionally, mm -hmm. and then we work into a red wine later. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. You know, I have to say a quick little story about when we were, we, we really believe that keeping family together involves being around the table, and certainly as a kid in Spain, we always, always ate every meal together. And so when our boys were young, um, we would have what was called lights out night. Uh, suddenly, magically, all the power in the house just 
ended, it disappeared. Because I went to the panel and shut the main switch off. And we would be right at this dinner table where we are now. With In the our, dark. With our oil lamps, these beautiful oil lamps. Wow. And if you want kids to stay at the table, then just have one light source right at yeah. the dinner table. All of and a sudden, they would. They would start to open up, tell stories, ask questions. And they would, instead of running back to their video games or whatever they were doing, we would have these, we would just, we wouldn't oversaturate and do it all the time. But it was, it was magical. Sounds, sounds like setting a romantic evening with the family. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you said you like to cook a lot. Mm -hmm. And food obviously plays a huge part. You do that in the tasting room as well. You want people to have that experience. How do you approach food and wine pairing? Do you think there are rules to follow? Or what rules do you follow? How do you try to pair things together? I try mm -hmm. not to be bound by rules, honestly. I think it really depends on... There's some instincts you know. I mean, there's some there's some basic rules that everybody follows, but there's no reason you can't have a red wine with fish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just have to choose appropriately. And I just like combining the um, different ingredients that are seasonal. And if they're, if they're seasonal, they're just gonna have so much more flavor. And so I try to just keep it simple. Are there certain things you look for in terms of spice or acidity with this or that, or uh, it's more I, too intuitive to explain. Yeah, I really go by instinct. I really, really do. Half the time, I just I don't even know what I'm doing, and I it, it you know it, it just works. it works. It really does. Or and I also take a lot of photography for my my blog. Um, I have a food blog called uh, it's Liz's Kitchen, oh. and before I know it, the the ceramic uh, bowl, the presentation comes together to match the label of the wine, and I haven't even realized I was doing that. So there's Absolutely. an artistic side to cooking, yeah. like they say, you eat with your eyes, and so um, I definitely focus on uh, the presentation. So when you um, think back to advice you've been given over the years, is there a piece of advice that you've carried with you in your career or in your life that you can share? Yeah, um, I think looking at the bigger picture, one of the things is um, when our family came to the United States, of course, we didn't have any land. And that was very important for me to be grounded in land and probably came from the fact that Spain and my experiences there. And so when we bought our first piece of property, uh, words that my father gave me came out, which is basically leave things better than you found them. And so that plays very strongly into concepts of sustainability. And so our piece of property is something we're stewarding during our lifetime. Maybe our kids will get to steward it but a lot of people whose names I don't know lived on it long before me, and a lot of people whose names I don't know will live on it afterwards. So my goal is to basically keep all of the oak trees healthy, plant more trees, create songbird habitat, not just the vineyards. Mm -hmm. It's the whole heterogeneity of that property mm -hmm. that we love so much and that has nurtured us. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Is there a piece of advice that you can share? Oh my goodness. I, I mean, my dad was very much the same way. Um, and uh, my mom and dad uh, built their house on property that's that's been in our family and always had an appreciation of nature and our surroundings. And I think it's important to, to realize that you are in coexistence with mm -hmm. your environment. Absolutely. So when you look back at your career, at careers, <laughs> not family, but looking back at your career, what would you say is one is your one of your proudest achievements to date? Mm. That's a good question. Lots have happened over the years, you know. I mean, I'm really proud of have um, being a teacher. I I guess I still do that as part of what I do in in um, in sharing recipes and educating people about Spanish varieties, mm -hmm. but. Um, but a single uh, achievement, it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint. <laughs> I have, I have three. Wow. Okay, good. Overachiever. Has three. What, what, I think uh, one is the introduction of really high quality, excellent clonal material or really Seleccion Masal from Spain into the United States mm -hmm. and then gifting that to the industry. That's mm -hmm. one thing that I, I really enjoy. The yeah. other thing is, um, uh, having been one of the co-authors of the seven AVAs of Lodi Ooh. that we submitted to the 
and then uh, the BATF, now the TTB in 2001, and getting that approved in 2005. So it never, no one had ever done seven conjunctive AVAs all the same time in a region that speaks, it speaks to the region, how right. we will work so closely together here in Lodi. And then I'd say the third thing is being a founding member of the California Farmland Trust, which the whole goal of the trust is to uh, preserve in perpetuity California farmland. So Those are lof mighty achievements yes. Yes. that are for future generations yeah, as you're... As you're <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this is a quick answer. Off the top of your head, a table without wine is like... A desert. <laughs> um, a, oh my goodness. I, I, he was I'm, so I'm, quick. I, I, I'm, 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 yes, That's okay. It's unfathomable. <laughs> he was so quick. It was yeah. like, <laughs> okay, another one. Um, we're sitting here at your dinner table, large table, and enjoying your wine. Um, and if you could imagine any person from any walk of life, living or deceased, that could be sharing a bottle of Bocash wine with you right now, who would you want that to be? Oh my goodness. I would look back at some of my pioneering ancestors that left their, their native countries and came across the plains, the hardships they had, crossing, um, losing uh, family members on the way, and to be sitting here to see what their sacrifices have brought to future generations, um, I would love to pop a cork with one of them. <laughs> wow, that's, that's, that's cool. Are you going to give me a celebrity? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it would be my father. I think that he would uh, love to see his last name on a bottle of wine. Oh, so. yeah, beautiful. Well, we're almost finished. Um, what I wanted to ask you, a couple quick questions. Deserted Island, three wines, what would you take? Ooh. Well, I would certainly take a cava because we do love cava. Mm -hmm. So that would be a way to celebrate being on a deserted island together. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then after that, I would take a Tempranillo and then I would take a Banyuls dessert Ooh. wine. Really rounding it out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I would bring a, um, a, a Syrah, um, and because that's one of our first loves of, of the wine industry, um, I would bring a, a Spanish um, Garnacha Blanca. And then the third, um, probably something dusty, maybe that's unidentified in the cellar because the label's already fallen off. <laughs> <laughs> so now we'll play a, a quick little game of pairing wine with music based on some of your wines or some of the wines we talked about. And just come up with a genre or music or a singer that you'd want to be listening to when you drink that wine or makes you think of. So let's start with Albarino. I've got a glass of your Albarino in front of me. What would you, what would we be listening to? Uh, Bolsa Nova, the nice, you know, kind of romantic start of the evening music Good one. for me. That yes. is you agree great. with that or do you have another yeah. idea? Well, I was thinking about the English beat. Oh, oh okay, that's yeah. quite different. <laughs> I, I like yeah. that. Um, and then what about your Grenache Blanca? Or Grenache Blanc? Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mecano. Mecano is a Spanish. Um, um, really fun music yeah. uh, group, you know? 80s and 90s rock. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that would be good. That would be good. <laughs> Mecano. Um, and your Tempranillo? Camarón de la Isla. Camarón de la Isla. <laughs> Flamenco. Flamenco, yes. yeah. It's just so... Guitar. Yeah, that canto hondo, that deep mm -hmm. singing, and oh, yeah. I'm and the last me. one, your Graciano. Wow. Miles Davis. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a beauty. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. You guys are on the same page. I like this. Wow. <laughs> one, We're guys. about to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary in a couple of weeks. So. Happy anniversary. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you plan your anniversary, what wine region is the top of your bucket list to go explore? Oh. Hmm. 
Well, given that we're... Let's see if you're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, given that we're, we're uh, still very domestic and can't get into a plane and fly to Europe, uh, one place that has really intrigued me is the Okanagan Valley. Ah, yeah. So that'd be mm. really fun. But anywhere, I'd love anywhere to in the world. Sicily. Sicily. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. Me too. Mm, someday. Well, you know, two trips, right? Two trips, yeah. yeah. Nothing stops you from two trips. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't have to be in agreement on this one. It just no. means more travel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. So while you plan your trips to the Okanagan Valley in Canada and to Sicily in Italy, if people want to come visit you here in Lodi, how can they visit Bokish? Oh, well, best thing to do is just find our website. So we're on the eastern side of Lodi, um, about 10 minutes from, from town, and we're in the rolling hills. Um, we're open five days a week. Uh, we're just closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so um, make your reservation come out. We've got bottle service um, with vineyard views. We've got picnic areas. Um, it's fabulous. So um, we welcome you to come, bring your family, bring your dogs, bring your picnic. Yeah. <laughs> and um, your website for everyone? It's bookishvineyards.com. Very easy. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, remember that the bookish has a C in it, S-C-H. Yeah. Ah. Well, Liz and Marcus, thank you so much for joining us on Wine Soundtrack. I hope you had a good time sharing your story. And uh, cheers. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.